the uh, the program and uh, start from the next block uh, because from the next block uh, you, you you can load some pre-calculated uh, observables you don't have to generate in 11 the, the 11th block so if it's really taking too long uh, you can just comment out everything over here uh, what did we say when we continue I think Stephen said the five minutes it's already five minutes I yeah we can continue Okay, yeah. So everybody, if you if you're really taking too long for you to run block 11, I would recommend you to pause it over here and then move to the next block. I think it should work. For example, if I don't have this thing at all. Uh, okay. You should, uh, <coughs> uh, let's see if you really need block eleven. Ah, okay. Uh, so it looks you really need to to go through block eleven. Uh, uh, how many yeses are there right now? Thirty-eight and two noes, and we had something like fifty active participants in the last exercise. Okay, okay. Then let's wait a few more time. Let's. Uh, okay, we have of... now forty yeses, so it's still still coming in slowly. Okay. Then, then in the meantime, I'll just talk about how we organize our following observables. Yep. So, so you see that uh, sometimes for some observables, it's very hard to get uh, the statistics under control. So in that case, you may, you may consider convert them into something simpler. So in this case, I convert this uh, distribution of uh, uh, eccentricities into the standard deviation and the schoolness of the distribution. So you can organize uh, the prediction at each parameter point into the following big vector. So this vector contains, uh, uh, the first 24 values contains the energy uh, deposition at the middle rapidity as a function of centrality. And for the next eight values, uh, Uh, it actually control. Oh, I actually controls two 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 centrality classes. Uh, so typo here. So there's the standard deviation of epsilon two distribution, standard deviation of epsilon three distribution, and uh, the schoolness of the two uh, at two different centralities. One from twenty twenty five, another from forty to forty five. So this uh, are another eight values for uh, model calculations at each parameter set. So eventually for each of the 100 parameter set, you get in total 24 plus four plus four, 32 numbers uh, to represent the model predictions. Uh, 32, okay. So in, in such a way, we can construct this uh, 100 by uh, 100 design points by 32 observable matrices. And along with our design matrices, this uh, finite model data are passed to the Gaussian process emulator uh, to, 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 train, to, to train them to learn how to predict these observables. So, so where do we stand on the number of yeses now? Yeah, it's not changing anymore. We have 42 yeses and two noes. I think we have to take that and move on. Okay. Yes, 43 yeses and I... one no. Okay. Big, big success story here. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, sorry about that. I really didn't expect that uh, sometimes can be very slow uh, on binder, even for making the plot. Uh, so if you run through block 12, 13, and 14. So this plots the, 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 the observables we're going to, uh, to train the emulator. So on, on the left is the 30, it's the 24 values of energy as function of centrality. On the right is the eight either standard deviations or schoolness of the eccentricity distribution. So here on the right plot, there's a very interesting way to represent uh, your data sometimes. It's called the, the violin plot. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, like, like, like you can see, it's actually this function is now actually called violin in, 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 the, in the Python plotting function. Uh, so, so this plot is that once, when you have a hundred uh, set of uh, calculations, for example, for sigma two, if you just plot, plot scatter plot, it, it all overlap together. It doesn't represent how it distributed at all. And this violin plot will uh, histogram those 100 values and use the, the width of this little shape to represent the probability density at that particular value. So it's just an a, a interesting way to visualize the data. Of course, if you are not uh, worried about uh, data being overlapped, you can also use scatter plot. Okay, now we, uh, we, we run into uh, the, the problem of building the emulator. Uh, so this is what the previous two small examples are, are talking about. We want to first use dimensional reduction uh, to reduce this 32 dimensional object into just a few, uh, a few degrees of freedom and only build one Gaussian emulator for each of these uh, principal component to make this process efficient. Uh, so if you at, the, at this point, go ahead and run block 15, which is exactly the same block you get from the PC example is the class uh, that defined to wrap the functionalities of the principal components. And please and press I'm yes after you have finished block 15. So is everybody uh, still, work, still working? We are at okay. 26. Can you see the yes count in when you click on your participants tab in the bottom? Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can see it. Yes. So you can follow yourself. Okay. So you do now. Okay, I think block 15 doesn't require any computation. So I'm just going to wait another minute and we'll move on. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, maybe let's uh, move on. Oh, good. So, so in, in block 16, again, it lets you to, to create a, 
uh, the number of uh, principal components you want to include it. And we build this, uh, here we call it transformer. Uh, uh, it transforms back and forth between the principal component space and the real space. So for those who are running this code on your local computer, uh, you can go ahead to use the, for example, the default number of, number of principal component NPC equals to five. Uh, for those who are using binder, uh, maybe let's choose two principal components because uh, if it's slow for you to generate the previous plot, it's probably also going to be slow when you train each of these principal components. So for those who are on binder, let's use number of principal NPC equals to two. And if you're on local computer, you can use five to six. Uh, local computer, okay? And we run block 16. And block 17 is the exact same plot we, we see in the principal component analysis example. It visualizes what this principal component looks like. Uh, looks like. So for my case, uh, if you focus on the first plot by choosing only two principal component uh, uh, we are only recovering about 90% of the data variance of, of its features. If you are choosing five to six, you are getting a much more uh, faithful representation of the original data, maybe up to over 99% of the data variance. Uh, so like we said, this principal component analysis uh, is used to remove linear correlations between observables, but it, not, it that doesn't guarantee that you can remove all the nonlinear correlations. Uh, for example, on the right-hand side uh, of the first column, I plotted the, uh, the 100 transformed principal components A and B. In this case, A equals to zero, B equals to one, the first pr two principal component if you actually compute the linear correlation coefficients, which would be printed right on top of your figure, this linear correlation between A and B are very tiny, it's uh, practically zero. So indeed, principal component removes linear correlations, but you can see there are apparent nonlinear correlations in your model. So, so sometimes this can be a problem and uh, for, for the effectiveness of the PCA, in this case, you may think whether you can make transformations of the observables or your parameterizations uh, to reduce this degree of uh, nonlinear correlations. And uh, in the bottom two plots, again, we show what this each principal component actually looks like in the real space. So for principal component one, uh, principal component one is almost a constant level for energy dependencies and almost a constant level for those uh, variants, uh, for those moments of the distribution of epsilon. Principal component two uh, is a linear dependencies as a function of centrality. Uh, you, you may wonder why it's growing with centrality because when you combine principal components, it's, there has an arbitrary constant in front of it, which can be negative. So with principal component one and the two, uh, you, 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 can, you can produce uh, this uh, decreasing feature of the uh, energy dependencies as a function, uh, energy as a function of centralities. Uh, of course, you can plot principal component three and four and so on. Uh, if you have time, you can see how each principal component looks like in the real space, what feature they may represent that you can understand. Okay. So after that, we go ahead and train emulators for each of the principal component. For me, it's just two. Uh, so here, uh, because we have more than one parameters, uh, this kernel is high dimensional. So instead of just uh, uh, 
a, a, a one-dimensional normal function as the kernel is actually a, a, a high-dimensional uh, Gaussian function. And in this case, I, I indeed add a, a noise term to the kernel because uh, to, to generate this calculation, I only use this, uh, I think, order 100,000 events, uh, which is uh, very high statistics for the energy dependencies of centrality, but uh, it might not be enough for the uh, epsilon distribution. So I can assume that there are still significant level of statistical noise in my training data. So in this case, in addition to this uh, Gaussian kernel, I'm also adding a white noise kernel. Are you, so, guessing, are you guessing the value of the noise or is the emulator optimizing it by itself? Yeah, it's optimizing by itself. Uh, like, like, like you can see here, when we actually build emulators, we, we call the Gaussian process regressor, passing it kernel and uh, let it optimize for a few times. Uh, so, so in this process, you, you can get an optimized value for each of these so-called hyperparameters. Again, for those on binder, I would recommend you, for now, you just change this n restarts optimizer to one, because this will take time. For those on your local computer, you can use a larger value, for example, five or 10. one. It will take some time to optimize the hyperparameters and print the optimized value uh, under this block. So, so here I'm going to make another pause to wait for uh, people to train their Gaussian emulators. Yeah, please press yes once you have completed block 18. So usually it doesn't take so long. Uh, on your local computers, it's, this is uh, still pretty fast. Okay, now, now I have uh, one of the emulator okay. trained. The first emulator is trained. So again, we need to check whether these parameters are, are reasonable. Okay, uh, before, maybe yeah. before. While we are waiting for some of the students to, um, for some of the votes to come in, uh, what, sorry, here's a question. What would happen if the noise parameter was not added and you have a case where the statistics is not, in high, not high enough for some observables? So if you don't have the noise term and there is indeed significant amount of noise in your data, uh, sometimes the Gaussian process may recognize some statistical fluctuation as actual physical features. Uh, for example, you vary the eta over s and you compute v2. Uh, in principle, v2 should increase, but you have so, many, so little events that v2 actually decreases. Uh, if you don't correctly estimate uh, this uncertainty, maybe your Gaussian emulator will try to emulate a model that uh, uh, behave exactly the opposite as your model. So it's very important to add this, uh, add this uh, white noise kernel uh, as you can think of it as a, as a regulator to the training process. Okay, good. So now why don't you go through the discussion of your results while some of the students are still working okay. on, it, on theirs. So, so here you, you see that once you, so we get two sets of results because in, in my case, I have uh, two principal components and therefore two sets of Gaussian process. Uh, for those who are on a local computer who are using five or six principal components, you may get more of these outputs. So here again, you see that uh, uh, this prefactor <coughs> in front of this uh, Gaussian kernel 
is order one or not far from order one because uh, when we train these observables, we often standardize observable by removing their mean and uh, uh, rescale their values so that the variance is close to one. The length scale uh, for different parameters <coughs> uh, uh, varies a lot because parameters has different uh, ranges, uh, but uh, you need to check whether this length scale compared to the allowed, va allowed range of variance of the parameters are not significantly below that or above that. For example, I can add another block over here. I just print out the ranges of my parameters. Okay, so you see the, for the first parameter, uh, the total range of the variance, the p parameter is from minus one to one. So the parameter range is two. And for the next parameter is 1.1 1 .1, and then 2.6 and then two. So you see that for this first parameter, uh, the Gaussian process is guessing a, a correlation length of indeed of order one, which is good. But for the very last parameters, uh, the Gaussian process is predicting a very large correlation length which means that uh, you don't get too much variance in these parameters while you train on these two particular uh, principal components. Finally, you have another kernel optimized, which is the white noise kernel. So here's the noise level. So for the first two principal components that I included, the noise level is very low. Maybe the first one is only as one thousandth. Seven, the second one is about 8%. For higher and higher order principal component where the feature are more and more tricky and the uh, uh, statistical fluctuation become, becomes important, you may observe a noise level that can be close to, to one, that 0 0.9, 0 0.98, something like that. So that's an indicator uh, of the, uh, for, for you that those principal components really don't contain any more information. They're just uh, white noise. And you don't really need to, to emulate uh, those principal components. Uh, of course, if a Gaussian process emulator works perfectly, it, it will figure out that, that that thing is just white noise. But sometimes it, uh, it will, if the training is not uh, successful, it will recognize some of the noise fluctuation as physical features, which could uh, uh, really bias your parameter extraction. So it's really important after your training to check whether these numbers looks reasonable. Okay, let me check how many yeses. Okay, 32, roughly the same number of yeses when we pass block 15. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So run through block 19. It's the same function as before. Uh, it gives a set of parameters and it generates the prediction and there's a prediction error. So now we go, we, 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 uh, we run into this uh, final part. Uh, Oh, so sorry, not to find, it's actually, uh, first we need to do a, a closure test actually. So, uh, oh, sorry, no, wrong use of word. It's uh, actually validating the Gaussian process. So by validating the Gaussian process means that uh, uh, whether this interpreter works uh, depends on its ability to, to accurately produce new sets of observables. Uh, sorry, sorry, new sets of predictions. So in this case, I generate Trento data with three sets of parameters that is not contained in the training data. So this is completely new information for the Gaussian process emulator we have built. And we're going to see whether they can uh, accurately reproduce this, uh, these calculations using these new sets of data. So if you run through block 20 and 21, So for my case, it's not, it's, uh, uh, it may not work very well because I'm only including two principal components, 
for those who are using, for example, five principal component, uh, you will find that, so, so this plot is the predicted value of Gaussian process emulator at this novel parameter input over the actual model calculations. You should find that the energy as function of centrality, this ratio is very close to one. Maybe we see in plus or minus 5% uncertainty if you include enough uh, principal components. Uh, of course, for, 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 for my analysis with two principal components, you see that uh, you have a larger uncertainty at larger uh, centrality classes, maybe up to 10 to 15%. But still, once you include the, include, uh, the correct magnitude of the emulator uncertainty, you see that uh, uh, you have this deviation, but uh, the emulator tells you that uh, this deviation is within uh, its predicted uncertainty band. So you don't run into overfit problems. And the red pool plots are the prediction compared to calculation for uh, the variance, uh, so, sorry, the standard deviation and schoolness of the eccentricity distributions. So this is not a very important step, uh, apart from checking whether the hyperparameters are reasonable, it's more important to check whether you can really make predictions, reasonable predictions at arbitrary new parameter set using this uh, emulator. Arbitrary new parameter set inside the region, oh, yeah, yes. inside yeah. the training region, yes. you can't you extrapolate. Have do, you have to do interpolation. You cannot go outside of the, uh, the design range. Yes, arbitrary parameter set inside the design range. Okay, uh, so, so usually make sure you, you, you always generate this plot before uh, you, you, you use this emulator in the Bayesian analysis. If this test doesn't pass, uh, it won't give you any reasonable results uh, in the following. Okay, so here's a question for you to think about maybe, how do you know these error bars are also correctly reflecting the interpolation uncertainty? So it's a statistical question. Uh, so it really depends on whether this error bar correctly reflects the deviation from the true model calculations, whether their magnitude are compatible. Okay. Now we go to this uh, final step, the last eight blocks. Uh, let, let's do a pool again, whether you have generated the, the, the validation plot and uh, is able to, to go to maybe start from block 22. Okay, I see, yes, this is going up. And based on past experience, we will continue once we reach maybe 30. Okay, great. So we want to now extract the model parameters. Uh, we always do this very, in a very cautious manner. So before we, we compare to real experimental data, we want to do a so-called closure test. So closure test is a, a concept uh, Jean-Francois introduced yesterday. Is that instead of using experimental, uh, ex experimental measured values to infer the parameters, uh, we are just going to use model generated data as pseudo data to infer the known parameters to see whether the inferred posterior uh, is a reasonable estimation of the true value. So in block 22, we're going to choose use pseudo data equals to true. So we're not using experiments yet. 
and the pseudo data index is equals to zero. It means that we are going to use the, the remember we generated the three novel Trento calculations a few blocks ago. We're going to use the first set of that calculation as the pseudo data. Now, if you run block 22 and 23, it will organize the pseudo experimental data for you and also tells you what's the true value of the parameters that generate in this set of data. So the true parameter values, uh, you better remember this so that we can compare later, uh, is p equals to 0.2, w equals to 0.5. Sigma is the, the standard deviation of the fluctuation we put in is 1.2. Uh, v is the, might be useful to, to again see what these are. So V is the minimum to the cube, S is one over square root of K, and normalization is the energy density normalization. Okay. And uh, as a reminder, uh, because this is our pseudo data, so we can estimate this that statistical uncertainty, but we don't have a systematic uncertainty. Uh, and also uh, we're assuming a 5% uh, statistical uncertainty for the standard deviation, the schoolness cumulants. Uh, of course you can compute uh, the actual uh, statistical fluctuations in these numbers, uh, but here I'm just assuming uh, a five percent uncertainties. Uh, once you go to experiments, uh, it may, you, you can just use the experimental bar in that case. So now, if you go ahead and run block fifteen, block fifteen, uh, sorry, block twenty-five, uh, block twenty-four and twenty-five. So block twenty-four and twenty-five. Uh, it's just a mathematical tool uh, called the Markov chain Monte Carlo to sample uh, parameter points from the posterior distribution. Uh, because given the likelihood function, the experimental uncertainty, the emulator prediction and experimental values and the prior range, you can just write down uh, the posterior distribution function. Uh, however, that thing is so high, high dimensional uh, it's very hard to do marginalization. It's hard to visualize. So usually we, we, we use this Mark, Mark of Chen Monte Carlo uh, to, to put samples from it. And when you project all these parameter samples onto one dimension, uh, you are effectively doing marginalization over other parameters. And it's also easy to visualize uh, this high dimension function from its samples. So, um, uh, in block 26, again, for those who are using binder, I recommend you to just load MCMC chain that I, I generated for you. And for those who are on local computers, uh, you, you can uh, generate your, your, your own Markov Monte Carlo samples. Okay. So, so since I'm loading the chain, it's only take seconds and I'm finished, but uh, uh, oh, Chen, oh, okay. So Chen, uh, I have to specify uh, the file name. So the file name uh, should be model data mc mc chains. That should do it. Okay. But I will wait for a few minutes for those who are using your own computer to generate your own chain. Uh, depending on how much 
uh, uh, workers to choose uh, how much burning step and how much production step, uh, it may take a few minutes. Uh, if you want this process to be faster, uh, just for demonstration process, you can reduce the number of workers to maybe to, to 20 and uh, reduce these numbers. If you uh, want to get some results quickly. In the meantime, while we are waiting for people generating the chain, uh, if you are loading my pre-generated chain, these chain are generated uh, from uh, Gaussian, from Gaussian emulators uh, plus five, I think six principal components. So it's quite accurate. So I'm going to do another pool once you have either loaded the chain or generated your own chain. I just press yes when this is done. Okay, it's going up. Oh, meanwhile, I can, maybe I can take a few questions if there's any questions uh, on Slack? Right now there isn't. I think everybody okay. is really busy trying to <laughs> catch up. You have about 15 minutes until yeah. the end of the... Yeah, we, we just have uh, three more blocks to go and all of them are like plotting functions. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, so so for those who have uh, finished generating the chain, uh, you can go ahead and run block twenty-seven. It plots some uh, plot that's very common in a multi-parameter Bayesian fit, which is the marginalized one-parameter posterior distribution and the. Uh, uh, so those are listed on the diagonal plot. So here's the one parameter distribution uh, with all the other parameter marginalized over for the P parameter. This is for the nuclear and West parameter, for the fluctuation parameter, and finally for the nuclear min minimum distance parameter. And oh, uh, there's one more, it's the normalization parameter. And on the off diagonal, you have the, the joint probability distribution of the posterior for each of the two parameters. Uh, uh, you can think of a way to visualize three parameter correlation, but uh, that'd be uh, not, not easy to, to show uh, on this two dimensional plot. So, so here you can see I've uh, drawn uh, a red lines and the blue lines in, in each of this plot. So the red line are the uh, red lines represents the, the true values that we put in, in the Trento simulation. And the, the blue lines are the median predictions 
of this Bayesian analysis. So by median is means that you, so you have this probability distribution for the value of P, you find the value where exactly half of your samples are above this value and half of the samples are below this value. So you may ask, why don't we just use the maximum uh, value for, for this distribution to define our best fit? So the maximum value can sometimes be deceiving. For example, uh, if your peak doesn't exist in your uh, 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 design range, uh, then, then your peak is uh, completely biased to one side of the, the, uh, this, 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 this function. And you, you will have to estimate some very unsymmetric uncertainties Another advantage of using median values instead of, for example, mean values or maximum value is that the medium is very robust against uh, a parameter transformation. For example, if I, if somehow in the model I, I didn't choose to parameterize P the current way, I choose another parameterization where the new P is related by this P by another square. So P prime equals P square. So with such a transformation, uh, this density distribution's maximum and this mean value will, will, will all be moved around by this transformation. However, as long as this transformation is monotonic, the median value is still the median. Uh, so that's why often we, we use median values as a, a central prediction for the parameter extraction. Uh, also, medium also allows you to, to define other quantiles. So medium is the quantile of the parameters at 50%. Uh, you can also define quantiles at 10% and 90% so that you have this 80% uh, credible limit. So here, uh, on top of each diagonal plot, you, s you, you will find uh, a mean value, uh, the median value plus or minus some number. So that plus or minus some number actually shows the 95% credible region, I think. Let me check. Yes, it's 95. It's the 2.5 quantile and the 97.5 quantile of the distribution. So you see that in such a way from this closure test, the true values are pretty good enclosed uh, in the quoted medium plus or minus uncertainties. Uh, you may notice that there's a very large discrepancies between this minimum nuclear distance parameter, but uh, uh, and this parameter is really not really constrained. And you have this medium around one and the uncertainty band stretching from zero to two. So it's still consistent with the uncertainty. So if you have time, you can go ahead and perform a disclosure test for the rest two set of the uh, of the, the validation site I provide you, but uh, for the rest ten minutes, let's just uh, imagine uh, you have passed a numerous test on this closure closure test, and we go ahead and compare with actual experimental results. So that will require you to go back to uh, block. Let me see, log 22, 22, where you simply change this use pseudo data to false. Uh, that's enough to, to activate using the experimental data. And you, you, you run through the rest of the block. Loading data, define the let loop function, uh, run CMC chain, and Again, for binder users, uh, you can load the pre-generated chain. Otherwise, you can generate your own chain for experimental data. And again, we have this final, uh, why it's not changed. Uh, okay, it's not changing. Let me see what's going on. Use pseudo data equals to false. Uh, 
-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so so here you get your uh oh let's see what's going on. So for experiment data, we don't have a true value, so I will turn off the red line. We are guessing what the true value is. Okay, so, so here uh, you, you see that you, using the experimental data, you will not know what the true value is for, for these parameters. So to, 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 to gain confidence in these extracted values, it's really important that you perform that closure test as extensive as possible. So of course, the closure test works doesn't guarantee you can. Al it also works for experimental data because closure test is a much simpler problem for the Bayesian analysis because you don't have model uncertainties. Uh, your model should precisely describe what it predicts given the correct set of parameters. However, what are the red lines? What are the red lines in the correlation plots? Oh yeah, I should turn that up either. Uh, so there's no true values for comparing two experiments. Okay. And uh, finally, to see whether these parameters provides a good description of the data, uh, you may want to sample from these parameters a uh, posterior and using uh, the inverse transform of the uh, emulator plus uh, principal component analysis to see whether the predictor observables agrees well with the experiments. Uh, because I think Jean-Francois also covered this yesterday, you can always constrain your parameters with a very well-defined peak while at the same time completely uh, off the data point. So eventually it's important to check whether you also provide reasonable description for data. So, okay, I'm drawing too much samples just to change this number. We're just going to sample maybe uh, 100 parameters and see what the predicted observables looks like. So this is a hundred parameter sets in the uh, con in the highest percent confidence region, or how? Uh, so it, yes. gets, it gets weighted with the probability, or how does that work? Uh, so it's pooled according to this uh, posterior okay. distributions. Okay, it it just draws. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. I think. There is something not loaded correctly over here. Uh, let's see what's going on. So experiments. Hmm. There are some discrepancies, but uh, this is fine because I think I've loaded the correct parameter set. So you expected this to describe the data well, and it doesn't, the expectation uh, yes. is not fulfilled, so you're looking for a problem, okay. Yes, this happened before, oh, oh I see. So, so this block never finishes. Okay. Okay, okay, so, so, so the logic is correct. So see, <clears throat> Again, I'm plotting the predictions as this violin shape uh, because after you put these 100 samples at each point, you have 100 scattered, plot, uh, scattered dots over here. And to visualize this uh, probability distribution, we use this uh, violin plot. So you see that most of the predictions are pretty close to the experimental value shown by the, the red dot. Uh, 
uh, of course, for this uh, on the right hand side, uh, the, you can see there are some some uh, some tensions in some of the observables. Uh, so these are often uh, can happen when you compare to experimental data, because uh, there's no point that uh, a model will describe more experiments in every detail. However, if you redo this process for the closure test, there are less tensions because the data, the pseudo data are generated from the model itself. So I think that will conclude uh, this huge example. Uh, there are still many uh, parts you can play with. For example, uh, you can try different uh, numbers of uh, principal components. Uh, uh, you, you can choose whether you want to include this set of observables or not. Uh, you can choose the how, how many uh, uh, optimization process you want to uh, you want to do over the, the, Ga the Gaussian process. Uh, you can you can try other Gaussian process kernels uh, and so on. So uh, I think. I hope that uh, this example is not just an example. Uh, uh, you, you can also modify it so that it, it, it can modify to, to your own small projects. I think it would be helpful. Yeah. OK. Uh, so, Uli, I'm giving this back to you. OK, so I don't see any leftover questions. Let me check. Um, there were, at the end, there were some technical issues which people are trying to resolve, but uh, no more physics questions of general interest. I think you're good. Uh, so this, is, this ends your presentation? Yes, yes. Okay. So let's have a vote on whether Wei Yao did a good job. Oh, thank you. I see the yes is coming in. <laughs> okay, so I think we should all uh, applaud you. Thank you very much. You. Stefan, anything else that we need to take care of before we send everybody home? No, I don't think so. I believe we're done. All right, chair number one, why don't you close the... the... Okay. Can I, can I uh, oh, yes. make a statement quickly? Yes. Hi, as just to everybody who's still here, uh, there's a poll on the welcome channel for the most helpful participant, somebody who helped you a lot on Slack or on the Zoom to, to, you know, to set up um, the Docker or anything else. Um, please you know, take that poll as soon as you can. Uh, it'll be open until the end of the school. Uh, there are some names already there, so you can just click on the names to vote on somebody, or you can add a name, you know, under the add option, right? And just add a name and you can just click on that name and then that's basically that you're voting for them. All right, thank you. That was it. All right, thank you.